All right, so on page 16, the very first question, which of the following best defines real estate? And the answer is C, the land and all the things permanently affixed to it. So we have the land, which gives us the subsurface rights. It gives us the air rights. It gives us the surface rights. Then we attach a house to it. We attach a fence to it. We attach a shed and a deck to it. That makes it real estate. When does it become real property? When we get the bundle of legal rights, right? Our deep C, disposition, enjoyment, exclusion, control, possession, all of those. That's when it becomes real property. Number two, which of the following is not a physical characteristic of land? Now, remember, we talked about the three physical characteristics. It's indestructible. It's immovable. It's unique. So obviously, scarcity is not one of those three. Scarcity would be more of an economic characteristic of land. Scarcity would be an economic characteristic of land. Number three, in North Carolina, the term provisional broker refers to B, a licensee who must operate under the supervision of a broker in charge. You're going to get a provisional broker's license. You're going to have, and it's going to be inactive. You're going to have to find a broker in charge who's willing to activate your license. And they're going, you're going to work directly for them. All right. You are going to do everything they ask you to do until you have your um, three 30-hour classes behind you and you do your post-license education. Number four. The term situs refers to C, societal factors that are related to the location. I'm a doctor. Do I want to live close to the hospital? Yes. I'm a teacher. Do I want to live close to the college? Yes. Um, I'm an attorney that handles trials. Do I want to live close to the courthouse? Yes. That's situs. Things that I need to, I want to be near because of what I do or what my family does or anything else like that. So that is what situs is. And those are societal factors related to the location. Number five, which of the following is not an economic characteristic of real estate? And we just said indestructibility was a physical characteristic. So obviously it is not a um, economic char characteristic. Scarcity, permanence of, of improvements, and location, all of those. And it's a good long-term investment. Number six, which of the following physical and economic factors would a land developer take into consideration when determining the optimum use of a parcel of land? Would he take transportation into effect? Yeah. Can we get to where we're going? What's available as far as natural resources go? Can we get city water? Can we get city sewage? Um, do we have running water? Are we? Uh, is it arid land? How can we dig? Right? Is it all um, heavy clay? And contour and elevation. Is it flat enough for us to build anything on there? Do we have to have special excavating equipment? Is that what it's worth? So all these things would take precedent. We would be looking at all of those things to see if we if we could build more houses or we can build a, a, a school or anything else like that, right? So all of these would be the reason. Number seven, a theater or hotel would be classified under the real estate category of these are commercial buildings. These are commercial uh, properties, okay? A theater, a hotel, a restaurant, you know, something of that nature, uh, your local boutique, grocery store, right? anything like that. Those are all commercial businesses. Number eight, the demand for real estate is influenced by the C, the wage levels and employment opportunities in the area, okay? None of these others make a difference, right? Real estate brokers, ethnic makeup, price of new homes being built versus the price of existing homes. We're just looking for what? The demand. What can we afford? Right? Wage levels, employment. Can I get a job? Number nine, the designation realtor refers to one, any licensed real estate broker. That is not true. Realtor organization has about 60, it's about 65 to 70% of the membership. Okay. About 65 to 70% of the membership. It is a group that's held to a, a bit of a higher standard. Okay. Uh, with a code of ethics. That's what they abide by. And there is tons of training and uh, usually a lot of dispute resolution. And number two, an active member of the National Association of Realtors. That's true as it pertains to the designation realtor. The answer to number nine is B, two only, two only. Number 10, which of the following statements is or are true of the business cycles? Okay. Number one, business cycles involve periods of expansion, recession, depression, and revival. And number two, 
The real estate business cycles is quicker to recover from depressed times than other business sectors. Yeah, the first one is A, right? We're going to have expansion, recession, depression, revival. Now, we have to be careful right now. What are we doing in this particular case? And we have a present day situation. We went through a period of, exp of expansion in housing. And what happens is this thing starts blowing up and everybody's making money. Now, all of a sudden, they raise the rates, right? So they raise the housing rates. They raise, every raise everything else. Now, what are we concerned about? Falling into what? A recession, right? That's right. That's next. So we're trying to keep away from that. Now, house prices are going to, uh, house ownership is going to fall. I don't know if prices are going to fall so much, but demand is going to fall. Okay. And it's already shown that. We have depression. When we get to the bottom of it, that's as much as it can get. And then it's going to revive itself again. So it's a big old cycle. We go up and down. We go up and down. So we can do that. Right. And that's what you got to look for. And we are the slow, we are so much slower to recover. We are a lagging indicator. We are not a, um, we are not a um, leading indicator of anything. When we go good, that means that there's a lot of other places that have already gone good. When we don't, when we go bad, we're usually lagging behind the market. All right, number 11, all the following factors tend to affect supply, except what? Yep, very good. D is correct. All of the following factors tend to expect, uh, affect supply, except Demographics, right? Labor force, construction group costs, government controls, all those things, right? We don't if we if we don't have people to build, if we don't have materials to build, if we have rules, taxation, everything else, those all affect what we can build. Number twelve, real estate can be a poor investment if a inflation rate is too high, the invest uh, investor plans to hold the investment for a long time, the investor needs ready cash. Or D, uh, land values are appreciating in the areas. Yeah, the answer is C. If I need ready cash, I can't do this, right? If I need cash by the end of the weekend, I can't, I can't possibly get it out of my house or out of my, uh, my building. So that's really the only thing that really makes that um, a poor inflation uh, if I need ready cash. Number 13, in general, when the supply of a certain commodity increases, prices turn to what? If we have extra supply, what happens to the other side? They tend to drop, right? We have too much supply. Supply of certain commodity increases. The more we have, I got to get rid of some of these. I'm going to drop the price competitively, drop the price. In the same token, what happens when we don't have a lot of supply at all? My demand goes up, right? Goes up through the roof. So that's what, if they're, that, and that's really what we were experiencing for the longest period of time. Very few houses were being built and a lot more demand. So, that is how supply and demand works. Number 14, in general terms, a market refers to which of the following? A place where goods are standardized for sale, the amount of goods available at a given price, quality of goods available to the public, and the place where the value of goods is established for 14. All right, so the answer is D, the place where the value of good is established, right? And this is what happens between a buyer and a seller. So an appraiser will come and give them an opinion of value, but the market price is going to be what? Would a buyer and a seller agree to pay, right? That's the price. You don't have to buy eggs. I went to buy eggs this morning. It was over $4 a dozen, right? Just a commodity to use that exact um, example. $4 a dozen. I was going to buy a lot of eggs. Did I buy any eggs? I bought one dozen, right? So we make changes, we make adjustments because I'm not willing to pay $4 a dozen for eggs. We make little, we make decisions, right? So that's what happens, right? So instead of buying two or three. So number 15, the demand for real estate in a particular community is least affected by, all right? So population, wage levels, employment, international trade. Do we care about international trade when it comes to um, the demand for real estate? In the rarer, rarest case, you can make an argument for it, but no. How much are they paying? Can I find a job? How big of a population is there? Is it overpopulated? Is it underpopulated? Those are. So the answer is D. Number 16, the real estate market is considered local in character for all of the following reasons, except, except A, land is fixed or immobile. B, consumers generally invest in real estate that is near their home or work. C, local controls can have a significant impact on the market. Or D, most people eagerly visit and invest in real estate in distance areas. All right, let me ask this in a different way. Think about your last vacation that you actually either drove more than 500 miles to, 
or you flew to? Did you buy real estate when you went there? Not really. The chances are pretty good that you did not, right? Yes, it was a great vacation. I'm sure you had a good time. But in most cases, you had a great time. And then you came home. So you did not eagerly visit and invest in real estate in distant areas. Okay, so the answer to the 16 is D. Number 17, the highest and best use of real estate will A, maximize the property's value, B, stay constant through t- throughout time, C, always be the property's current use, and D, not be affected by local economic trends. Um, the answer for the last question is D for number 16. Number 17 is what? A, right? Maximize the property's value. What's the best thing we could use it for at this particular moment? All right, number 18. A major manufacturer of automobiles announces that it'll relocate one of its factories along with 2,000 employees to a small town. What effect will this announcement most likely have on the small town's housing market? Houses will likely become less expensive as a, a result of the announcement. Houses will likely become more expensive as a result of the announcement. Uh, because of the announcement involves an issue of demographics, not of supply and demand, housing prices will stay the same. Or D, the announcement involves an industry, industrial property. Residential housing will not be affected. So the answer is obviously what? B, right? I can tell you when Amazon decided they were going to put a house out in Fayette or put a uh, facility in Fayetteville, and they were offering jobs, right? Lots of jobs. When they did that, they didn't have to put a stick in the ground. All they had to do was make the announcement. And then what happened? Everybody, the property values went up, right? Around where they were going to go. Once people found out where they were going to go, what was going on there? Well, those folks that lived in that area or own property in that area, the price went up. And that's just a prime example. But that happens pretty much everywhere, right? When you, when you, whenever something big like that comes on, in South Carolina, it was Boeing, when Boeing was going to build uh, the um, aircraft down here, or when BMW was going to build, right? Yeah, anything like that. So, so it is all, um, you know, it's all people just hear it and the anticipation. And that's called the principle of anticipation. Number 19, a buyer is interested in a house that fits most of her needs, but it's located in a busy area where she is not sure she wants to live. Her concern about the property location is called A, physical deterioration, B, area preference, C, permanence of investment, or D, immobility. Pretty straightforward question, right? She has an area preference. Even though her job is moving to another city, she wants to stay close to family. Maybe she just doesn't want to go there. Maybe she doesn't want to work into the inner city. Whatever those reasons are, that's her area preference. She doesn't want to be there. Any one of us here can move to Wyoming, can't we? We choose not to. Maybe not in the not maybe not in the mountains and the ski lodges, but I'm sure we can find a house out there. Montana is a lot of open land there, right? Maybe we, that's we. Any one of us can do that. Why? We choose not to. That's area preference. Number twenty: a professional estimate of a property's market value based on established methods and use, uh, using trained judgment is performed by a a real estate appraiser, b a real estate broker, c a real estate counselor, and d a home inspector. And this is what? An appraiser, right? The appraiser does a property market value. They give an opinion of value. Chapter 17, we'll be doing a lot of appraisal work. And we'll get the feel of what that's all about. You'll see as we go along, question one, uh, unit one, uh, they're just kind of getting you motivated into these questions, kind of giving you used to answering these questions. As, you, as, we, as we keep going on, the questions are going to get marginally larger. What they start doing is they start throwing more and more information in the questions, a lot that you won't need, but you got to cipher your way through it. And that's the hard part. The hard part is not answering the question because logic will take care of the question. The hard part is ciphering out information that you don't need, right? And getting in there and saying, all right, I don't need that. I don't need that. This is the premise. This is what I need to do. So we're just kind of weaning our way in there. We still have a long road to hoe. We want to buy a house. So we have a house. But I got to tell the attorney how I want to own it. What do you mean how you want to own it? Well, am I a sole owner? Am I going to take it with my spouse, with my wife? Has to be husband and wife. Um, Are we going to have um, survivorship? If I die, is she getting all my stuff? Or if I die, 
am I giving all my stuff to my kids and not to my wife? My, maybe I have a first marriage and we'll talk through this. So that's what we're going to talk about now, how we're going to own this property. There are four different types of ownership. The first one is ownership in severalty. I'll talk about that in a second. Then we have tenancy in common, joint tenancy with rights of survivorship. And then we have tenancy by the entirety. This first one is a little contradictory in the fact that you've got to think of it a little differently. Usually when somebody says there are several, that means what? Usually what? More than one, right? Usually? Not necessarily. In this particular case, when they say ownership in severalty, that means we have severed relations with everybody else and we have one owner. That means that I don't have anybody else that owns it. I own 123 Main Street. It's mine, Sam Hassel, period. I don't have to share it. I can do whatever I want with it. I can leave it to my kids. I can leave it to the guy down the street. I can do whatever I want with it. It's mine. I don't have to get anybody's permission. So that's ownership in severalty, all right? So it's different than multiples of us. So the ownership in severalty is as simple as that. One person owns it. Tenancy in common. Maybe we have, I have 75% of the house and um, my second wife owns 25% of the house. That's all good, right? So we can have it. But I want, I have a first family. I have a wife and three kids from my first family. And if I die, I want them to have that property. The only way I can give it to them is by, if I put own it in tenants in common. So I have 75%. My current spouse has 25%. In those particular cases, what we have here is that I can, as tenants in common, I can leave my property, my 75%, to my kids in my will. But I'd have to die, all right? I can die. All right, so this is tenancy in common. We have Jack and we have Jill. They ended up, after Jack had a wife and three kids, let's say Jack owns 50%. And Jill owns 50%. They have it now. But Jill is Jack's second wife. Didn't quite work out the first time when they came down the hill. They weren't quite as good friends. But Jack has three kids from the first marriage. So if as tenants in common, if Jack dies in his will, if he does not leave this property to Jill in his will, he leaves it to his three kids. Guess who now owns his half of the property? The three kids. Not in this one. There is no survivorship in tenancy in common. No survivorship in tenancy in common. Now, Jill has half of the house, and Jack's three kids with their baby mama, they all have the other half of the house. This is not going to be a fun relationship, is it? I can just read the writing on the wall. It's probably going to be ugly. Now, one more thing with this. Let's say Jack, still alive, and this is only happens over in death, okay? Well, let's say Jack's still alive. And Jack has a bit of a gambling problem that he didn't tell Jill about. So Jack says to his buddy Roy, Guido's going to break my ankles if I don't pay him back. And I need to pay him back like now. And Roy says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll buy 25% of your, of your house. I'll split it with you. Can Jack sell 25% to Roy? Yes, he can, right? And then he owns 25%. And then now when Jack dies, the 25% goes to the kids. Roy owns 25%, and Jill still owns 50%. So that's tenancy in common. I can do whatever I want with it, okay? So tenancy in common. Now, the only one that's not going to be a happy camper at the end of this is who? It's going to be Jill, right? She's not going to have a good time. However, Jill should have done something well before this. Ownership interest may be unequal shares. doesn't have to be 50-50. could be 75-25. could be 60-40. could be either one. Each owner holds an undivided interest in several things, can sell, convey, mortgage, or transfer that interest. I just told you, we sold 25% to Roy. Nobody can stop me from doing it. And when I die, I can leave it to my heirs. So ownership in severalty, when I die, I can leave it by will. Ownership, uh, tenancy in common, when I die, I can leave it in my will to my whomever I want. So much like this says, we can own it 60-40. If I die, I can give it to my eat my two kids. If I have two kids, and she still gets the same forty, you have to all you have to do is ask for it. Shelby asks, "How does the tenancy in common come about?" 
All you have to do in any of these, well, these next two, and I'll tell you why. Ownership and severalty means only one person is going to own it, so you're going to get that owner automatically. We talk about tenancy in the entirety. We're going to see it's just husband and wife, so you're going to get that. That's the default position in, in um, North Carolina. But the two in the middle, tenancy in common and joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, they're both you have to ask for them. Just tell the attorney you want to join up that way. Now, let's talk about survivorship with these next two. First two, there is no real survivorship. Obviously, one owner, tenants in common, I do what I want. Joint tenancy. North Carolina makes this a little fuzzy, so I want to make sure you're clear. I'm going to give you how you're going to see this on the national portion of the exam, and then I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in North Carolina. North Carolina changes this just a little bit. So the first thing is a joint tenancy with the rights of survivorship is how it's called. Usually, ownership is equal. Now, you will see that they're going to have to, on a national portion, they're going to have to have these four unities, possession, interest, time, and title. So they're going to have to take possession with the same amount of interest at the same time, and all of them have to be on the title. Possession, interest, time, title, P-I-T-T, for all you Brad Pitt fans out there. They have to have all four of those. Now, does this mean I only need two people with joint tenancy with rights of survivorship? No. What if me and three of my golf buddies decide to go buy a, a condo in Pinehurst and split it four ways? One of us dies, the other three get their share. It's really as simple as that. In the national portion of this exam, all right, ownership interests are going to be equal. In the North Carolina law, ownership does not have to be equal. Everybody has to be on the deed. Everybody has to be on the title. All joint tenants must purchase at the same time and all must appear on the deed. If one of them dies, survivorship goes to the other remaining parties, one party, three parties, whatever it is, except in North Carolina where that must be mandatorily stated. So if I'm going to get joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, I have to make sure it says rights of survivorship in there. So in the bottom of this, it says that in North Carolina, survivorship must be intentionally added by appropriate wording in the title. It can't be just joint tenancy. It's got to say, the attorney's got to put in there with the rights of, of um, survivorship, joint tenants with rights of survivorship. Let's look at a couple of more things that'll make this a little bit clearer. All right, two people buy this house, 50-50, right? Joint tenants, so they have possession, interest, time, title, P-I-T-T. -T. The owner dies. If that's the case, survivorship says that the other person, regardless of what's in their will, regardless of what's in their will, he could have left his, his property to his three kids and his first wife, but the will says it's joint tenancy with rights of survivorship. The other person gets the house. Doesn't matter what's in his will. The will cannot supersede survivorship. So in this particular case, the, the surviving spouse or surviving other people would get a claim. All right, so let's look at Jimmy and Stan and Samantha here for a second. Jimmy, Stan, and Samantha buy this nice little tropical paradise here. Looks pretty nice. All three purchased at the same time and all appear on the deed. Well, what happens is Jimmy kicks out, passes away. So the, his ownership, his 33 and a half, uh, 33 and a third percent now gets split between Stan the man and Samantha. Now they are 50-50 owners. Still joint tenancy with rights of survivorship, right? One dies, the other two get their share. Stan the man has had enough of Samantha. And he says, Felix, my buddy, how about buying my share? I've had enough. I can't do it anymore. So Stan sells his 50% to Felix. Can Felix be a joint tenant with Samantha? He doesn't have pit, right? He doesn't have possession at the same time as Samantha. So he does have the same interest, all right? But he needs all four of these unities. Time and title, right? He's on the title. He has two of the four, but he doesn't have all four. So he's going to be a tenant in common with Samantha, and they're going to own 50-50. Felix, in this particular case, can do whatever he wants with his share. Samantha can do whatever she wants with their share. So now they are tenants in common for this piece of property. No longer do we have joint tenancy with rights of survivorship. So the property is owned by three or more joint tenants, and one uh, joint tenant owner conveys an interest to the other person the new owner becomes tenants in common with the other joint owners. Now, let's say Jimmy, remember Jimmy back in the first one? So let's say Jimmy sells his property to Felix. 
So now Felix would be a tenant in common with a 25% ownership. And these two would be 33 and a third percent, still 33 and a third percent ownership. No good. Jimmy would not have possession. He would lose it. Um, so now Stan the man dies. His 33 and a third still survivorship with Samantha. So now she owns what? 66 and two thirds. Felix still owns um, Jimmy's 25% or 33% here. 33 and a third. I used the wrong number. So now Samantha would have 66 and two thirds. Maybe Jimmy only sells, let's say he owns 33 and 33 and a third. Stan the man here only sells 25% to Felix. So Felix would be tenancy in common for 25%. Stan the man would own 25%. And Samantha would still own her, um, um, well, they're 50-50. So she would still own her 50%. Stan doesn't, he kicks the bucket. She gets his, seven, his 25. So it would be 25% for Felix and 75% for Samantha. That's rights of survivorship. Okay, now. How do we get rid of this? You all know what happens when you get more than one person, right? How do three people keep a secret? Two of them die, right? That's how three people keep a secret. Um, so if we have three people who own this thing, we're not going to be sooner or later something's going to get. So how do we get rid of this? Voluntary agreement of the co-owners. We can all say, well, let's just all sell our shares to whomever. And it's gone, right? Once we sell it to somebody, we can no longer have joint tenancy. What if we have a husband and wife or a husband and friend who are not married and we're splitting 50-50, but now all of a sudden we want to, you know, we become common law and now we want to separate. Well, we have to have a partition suit. The attorney's going to separate us, right? We're going to do a quick claim deed and the other party's going to get the money, going to get the house, whatever that's worth. Or if any of those tenants, those unities, possession, interest, time, title, any of those change. This is over. Joint tenancy is over. It becomes tenancy in common. It defaults to tenancy in common. Concurrent forms again still. Now, husband and wife. It has to be husband and wife. This is what North Carolina, the state of North Carolina, wants you as a husband and wife to take your property in. This is the default position. If me and my wife go in to purchase a house and we sit down in front of the attorney and we don't say anything about how we want to take ownership, this is what we're going to get. Tenancy by the entirety. So what does that mean? Well, tenancy by the entirety means that we both technically own 100% of this property. You can call it 50-50, but it doesn't really matter. If one of us dies, the other one still has all the property. So it is an undivided unity of possession. We're all together. The owners have to be spouses when the title is received, okay? If I, bring them, if I have a house prior to getting married, that could be still ownership and severalty. But if I take it and we buy it together, then it's going to be tenancy by the entire. Ownership interest must be equal, 50-50 or 100% for everybody, but usually it's 50-50, let's say that. And both of us have to sign in order to sell a portion of it, okay? We both have to be committed. So if I am Jack and I'm going to sell my piece, a piece to Ray, all right, or Roy, I got to get Jill to sign. Both of us have to sign it. And then he would be a tenancy in common again, because he took it afterwards, and we would still be tenancy by the entirety. This could be terminated by death, divorce, mutual agreement of the spouses, okay? Anything that would separate a marriage, it would separate this uh, um, tenancy by the entirety. And lastly, survivorship is automatic. It doesn't have to be stated anywhere. It doesn't have to be in anybody's will. It doesn't have to be anything. The other party, because they technically own 100% of this, one party dies, the other party gets it all, all right? So that's what tenancy by the entirety is. So we have four tenancies. Tenancy in severalty means I'm the only owner, single. Tenancy in common means that I can do whatever I want with my half or my piece of it. I can leave it to my heirs. It's, one, it's the only one that I can leave to my heirs. The other two, joint tenancy with rights of survivorship and tenancy by the entirety have survivorship which means that regardless of what you say in your will, it does not defeat the survivorship of these clauses. So you can say you can give it to your kids, but they don't get it, not until Jill dies. What about condos? What about co-ops, con uh, co uh, townhomes? They're owned differently. If you own a condominium, does, everybody, does anybody here live in a condo, right? A couple of you might live in a condo. 
You own the pool. You can use the pool, right? Certainly can use the pool. So, but you, you, the common grounds, the pool, the gym, the whatever there, those are what? They're shared spaces, right? Everybody gets to use them. So they run a little bit differently than what um, home ownership would be on that piece of property. If I have a condo, I am certainly going to be ownership of my um, unit. Do I own the walls of my, if I own a condo, do I own the walls? I own a small part of the walls, right? Because those are part of the uh, HOA or POA and I am a small part. For our discussion here, let's assume there's 100 units in our condo. Let's assume that there are 100 different owners. Well, I own one one hundredth of the walls, but I own by myself the airspace in my unit. That's what I've mortgaged. So if you ever thought you bought air, buy a condo. That's exactly what you bought. Um, but it's ownership and severalty, and it has value because of the other things, all right? Because of the other things. So we're going to talk about condos. We're going to talk about cooperatives. We're going to talk about um, time uh, townhomes, and we're going to get into town share uh, timeshares a little bit. I want to buy a condo. Great places to live. You're going to pay an HOA fee, but you're going to have an undivided um, part of a hole in outside. So, if I am a condo owner, I have a fee simple title to airspace inside the four walls of my unit. All right, I may have exclusive rights. Um, some condos have storage sheds. For um, owners, I don't own the storage shed, but I have what's called a limited common element. Nobody else can use it but me, right? Maybe a deck, maybe a patio, right? I own the airspace in my unit, but I have limited common areas. Nobody else can have a party from the neighbors on my deck, right? Not allowed to do that. That only I can use that space, but I don't have ownership of it. Everything else that's around that condo, I am tenants in common with everybody else, my other 100 owners, my other 99 owners, me and 99 others. If you go to the pool at your condo, you don't have 100 squares drawn in the bottom of the pool, right? Where you can only stand in that one square, right? You can use the whole pool. So that is an undivided, all right, an undivided part. So you're a tenants in common without the right to partition. You can't segment it off. You can't have a big old field, a party field, a big old common area field, and say, all right, this is Sam's section, this is Tyler's section, this is uh, Susan's section. We can't do that. You are a tenant in common with the common spaces, with the common elements. You are ownership in severalty. You have fee simple ownership of your airspace in your unit, right? You are tenant in common with the other owners for the common elements. And you pay property taxes for your individual unit. And you also pay your HOA dues or your, you know, POA dues, property owners association, H homeowners association, whatever they want to call it, COA, condominium association. You pay in the uh, monthly fees to keep the taxes, the insurance, the maintenance, all of those other things on that community. Now, the North Carolina Condom Condominium Act, this is a state issue. This is a state issue. So the North Carolina Condominium Act says that if I am developing a condo, I'm the developer, I have to file a plat map. I have to go to my zoning and my, um, my zoning board in my community and say, this is what my plat's gonna look like. This is what my, my area is gonna look like. And oh, by the way, here is the master deed. Here is the covenants and restrictions. Here is the bylaws of what I see this community being. Okay, all of those things have to be given to the zoning and planning boards. Uh, I have to create a public offering statement and I can start showing the properties. I can start doing all of that. As long as I give them a public offering statement, the purchaser or a want to be purchaser prior to any contract signing. All right, this is what's going to happen. This is our plan here. This is what we've given to the developer. I mean, this is what we've given to the planning and zoning boards. <clears throat> Here's a list. This is what this is going to look like. When you're building a condo, you're building it off of pictures, right? You're buying it off of pictures. If there's no building there, you're buying it off of pictures, probably getting a good price. So I got to give that prior to signing the contract, I have to give them that public offering statement. This is what we're doing. Now, once we get the final plat map back from the planning and the zoning, I have to give the purchaser of the new condo, I have to give them a, um, a new plat map and bylaws. 
if it has changed significantly since that original public offering statement, as a condo buyer of a new condominium, not a resale, a new condominium built from the ground, I have a seven day right of rescission. I look at this, I look at the new plat map after it's been approved and what was a um, 50,000 square foot pool is now 20,000. What used to have five acres of green space now has uh, an acre of green space. So there's been big changes, right? What used to be 100 units is now 200 units. Anything that's changed like that, I need the ability to get out. That's not what you said at the beginning, right? If we're looking at this, we said, hey, um, you know, this is what you tried to sell me. This is what you, you told me I was buying. And now it's not that. So once I get that, I have a seven-day right of rescission like to get my money back. And at that point, I can go back and do that. Now, important point here. This is only for new construction condos. So let's say Reagan has a condo and I go to buy Reagan's condo. I don't have a seven-day right of rescission unless she was the builder and she built it and it was still being built, all right? That's the only time I have it. But if it's an arm's length transaction in a resale, you do not have a seven day right of rescission. This is only for new construction. And no, you do not own the land your, your condo sits on. No, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that would be a townhome, a little bit different. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.